Long ago, there was a wicked man named Haman. Like many throughout history, Haman hated the Jews with vengeance. He especially despised a faithful believer named Mordecai. The biblical account of these events is found in the Old Testament book of Esther. Wanting to make an example of Mordecai, Haman built special gallows, about 75 feet high, according to Esther 5, verse 14. The enemies of God hate God's people. The enemies of God hate choice servants of the Lord. And so he had a sinister plot. Through a remarkable providence, the Lord turned the tables on Haman. When the fateful day came, it was hateful Haman who ended up hanging from the very gallows he himself constructed. God rescued his people just as he promised. Now to set that familiar story into its biblical larger context, I'll remind you that Genesis 12 verse 13 warns that those who sin against the Israelites will be cursed. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10 adds that anyone who opposes the Lord will be shattered. And there's a warning given in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 22, where God says, touch not the Lord's anointed, especially not the ultimate prophet, priest, and king, Jesus Christ. He is Messiah. He is the anointed one of God. Let's learn more of him and his ways as we turn in our Bibles now to John chapter 8. This is the second and final message of uh, John 8, 1 through 11. This well-known story is at the same time one of the most misunderstood and misapplied passages in the Bible. Generally, when somebody makes reference to it, uh, they wrongly take from the passage a principle and, and give to it a meaning that God never intended. Way too many people forget that Jesus is the main character. And far too many quote John chapter 8, verse 7, out of context. Generally, when I hear unbelievers quoting God's word, it's it's generally uh, an attempt to cover up sin or immorality. Uh, Knowingly and unknowingly, they twist and distort the word of God, seeking to placate and justify their sinful ways. The following five headings should help us to rightly understand this powerful and very practical portion of Scripture. We had time last week to highlight headings one through three. Now, remind you, in John 8, one through four, we saw first the cold hearted trap. John 8, one through four highlights. The cold-hearted trap. A cold-hearted trap is laid by Jesus' religious enemies. Let's look at the text together. John 8, 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives following the events of John chapter 7. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. The temple's in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the the, the epicenter of what had become Pharisaical, apostate 
self-righteous Judaism. Uh, Jesus is a marked man. And so he is, is coming by faith, following the direction of the Holy Spirit in accordance with the plan of, of God the Father. He returns uh, to the, into the belly of the beast. And what did he do? Why is he there? Verse 2. As was often the case, large crowds gathered around him. All the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. This, of course, would have only uh, further fueled the, the, the wrath and the anger and the animosity and the jealousy against Jesus by the religious and political higher-ups in Israel. And so they devise, knowing that the next time they had an opportunity, maybe catching wind of the fact that Jesus was going to return to Jerusalem, they try and lay a very cold-hearted trap, verses 3 and 4. And the scribes, the so-called experts in the Old Testament law, and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the midst and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Without re-saying everything that was said last week, I remind you that this is, has nothing to do with, with their zeal for, for holiness and the part of this uh, lady who, who had greatly sinned against husband and heaven. This passage, this trap uh, is cold-hearted. This is not about the glory and honor of God. This is about them. This is about what they want to maintain and hold on to. Power, influence, control. And the threat to them, the greatest threat, was this so-called prophet Jesus. And so they devise a cold-hearted trap using and abusing this sinner, bringing her into the context where everybody would be around where the, where the word would travel through the mouth of many witnesses, they believe that they have Jesus caught where they want him. Again, I said, they, they treat this lady like a, a dirty worm as they seek to catch the elusive kingfish Jesus. They themselves are guilty of violating the Ten Commandments. They act like they can, are concerned about God, His holiness, thou shalt not commit adultery, but in reality, they have already violated the commandments for in their heart, they have murderous thoughts, rage fueled by jealousy and envy. And so they bring this lady and thrust her before Jesus and say, what are you going to do? He passes judgment and is the leader of a Biblically prescribed punishment for unrepentant adultery. And then Jesus would be in trouble with the Romans who had taken away the, the capital punishment uh, from uh, the leaders and people of Israel. Uh, if he passes over this woman's sin, uh, then he's going to show himself not to be a, 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 a prophet of God, a real servant of the Lord, and uh, they can hopefully then have grounds to accuse him. This is, is clearly... What's, at, what's taking place, as we'll see in a moment. This cold-hearted trap leads us to, secondly, the dishonest question. Sometimes people ask questions, and they are very disingenuous. They are very dishonest. Uh, they, they trap it up. They, 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 they even throw in a, the, the term teacher, rabbi, as if they have some measure of respect and deference shown to Jesus. We know the exact opposite is the case. Verse 4, we find number 2, the dishonest. Uh, verse 5, we see the, the dishonest question. Now in the law, the law of God, prophet Moses, verse 5, commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say, O teacher? They are trying to pit 
Jesus, who we know to be the Son of God, against the Father God. They are trying to pit Prophet Jesus against Prophet Moses. They're trying to find a way to have Jesus say something uh, that will demonstrate to the people that he is not a faithful teacher. He cannot be trusted, and therefore everyone should run from him and even enjoin them in, in rising up against him as a false teacher and threat to the ways of God. What do you say, O oh wise one? This brings us then to, thirdly, the wiser than Solomon response. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, endowed with this gift from God as a king. He, he of course, is in some ways trying to reflect a greater king and one who would be infinitely wise. That one is there in the midst and his name is Jesus. Jesus, his response with a few actions and a few words will completely turn the tables on his accusers, his enemies. He will reveal their true spiritual colors. He will undress them. He will escape this trap and he will proclaim the gospel and perform the mighty work of salvation that God had sent him to earth to do. He is wisdom incarnate. He is greater than Solomon. Notice verses 6b through verse 8. No, I'm not reading anything in the text. It wasn't there. Verse 6 says, why were they saying this? This dishonest question. They were saying this, testing him, in order that they may have grounds for accusing him. They want to take Jesus out. They want to bring Jesus down. What does Satan try to do today? He wants people to ignore Jesus, to deny Jesus, to reject Jesus. And even better, if they would hate Jesus. This doesn't happen simply in the, the godless pagan world. This often takes place with the most religious of people. They feel like they finally have Jesus right where they want him. There's no way he can get out of this one, right? The wiser than Solomon response, verse 6b, but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, there would have been murmurs over what, what did he say? What did he say? Large crowds getting from the front to the back. Uh, but they s said, we're not going to allow him to, to change the subject or, or, or to address us. They persisted in accusing him, asking him. So Jesus stood up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Like a champion boxer, Jesus turns perfect defense into perfect offense. And this leads us to a fourth heading, number four, as we pick up now where we left off. We come to the we've been exposed exodus. Enemies of God and non-believers have a, a long track record of trying to, to trip up the people of God, to trip up faithful servants of God, Haman with Mordecai. Now here they are, they are seeking to mess with an individual who, who they have, the religious leaders of a Pharisaic Judaism have no idea who, who, they're, who they're dealing with, who's standing in their midst. They should be leading the way as leaders of so-called Judaism in embracing Jesus, celebrating his arrival, repenting of their sins and welcoming their king. Instead, they oppose him with increased hostility. Their self-righteous hypocrisy is about to be exposed. Their true spiritual colors are going to be exposed. 
and there will be an exodus. Whatever Jesus wrote, and the few words that our Lord shared were enough to proverbially completely undress them. Notice the we've been exposed exodus, verse 9. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone. And the woman, where she had been in the midst. Touch not the Lord's anointed. You want to rise up in opposition against Christ, be warned. Here in verse 9, the self-righteous enemies of Christ clear out one hypocrite at a time. They leave with proverbial egg on the face. Or maybe better said, they leave with a Haman-esque noose wrapped tightly around their own necks. The Lord delivered the Lord. Jesus, here again, we have an example of a great escape. And for those of you familiar with the four Gospels and the life and ministry of Christ before his crucifixion, realize that this great escape is really par for the course. The unbelieving world tries and fails and tries and tries and tries again. When will unbelievers realize that their their arms are too short to box with God? What you find here in John chapter 8 illustrated is this. The all-wise Messiah is too shrewd to be trapped and too protected to be killed outside of God's sovereign will. He is invincible, for he always walked in the center of God's will. You say, well, you know, it's one thing for a pastor to... to highlight the wisdom of of Christ in escaping the situation. But eventually they get him. I know the end of the story. Eventually Jesus ends up on a cross. Yes, he does. By his own volition. According to the sovereign purposes of God. Acts 2.23 John chapter 18 and following is crystal clear that the ultimate reason Jesus ends up on a Roman cross is because the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many. He came to die. He not only came to fulfill the law and to do so perfectly, but to pay the penalty of the law as the God-man substituting himself in the place of sinners. Mark 10, 45. Jesus died for us. He came for us. It was not his appointed time to die at this time, and therefore, he manifests just a glimpse of his wisdom. This is wisdom incarnate. This is the embodiment of the wisdom of God. As I told you last week, you would be an absolute fool not to follow this king. Jesus does die, and he died for us, 1 Thessalonians 5.10, so that whether we believers are awake when he returns or fall asleep prior, we all might live with him. There's no resurrection without a cross. There is no salvation without an empty tomb or a cross. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He pays the penalty for all who would believe in him by suffering in our stead, enduring 
God's wrath on the cross. But this was not the time, the manner, and the way. And so we have Jesus' enemies. Jesus exposes them. Every time they're exposed, rather than humbling their heart and repenting, they become harder and harder of heart and become more determined to try to find a way to take Jesus out, legally or illegally. But now we come to the most important heading, the moment we've all been waiting for. The we've been exposed exodus gives way to what I'm calling, fifthly, the gospel admonition. Uh, Today we are going to receive the gospel admonition. If you receive it by faith, you will be blessed, uh, you will be encouraged, you will be challenged, you will be helped. Verses 10 through 11 declare what I'm calling, fifthly, the gospel admonition. You say, well, what's an admonition? Webster's Dictionary defines admonition as, quote, a gentle or friendly reproof. Because you say, okay, the enemies of Christ uh, have have hit the road. Uh, The rocks have been placed in their underpants and off they went. But now the teacher is left with This lady, she did not go with her accusers. Obviously, she's now standing there. What, to this point, Jesus hasn't, to our knowledge, even said a word to her. He dealt with the self-righteous, hypocritical leaders of apostate Judaism. What about the adulteress? Jesus will speak to her and through the word to us, this gospel admonition. An admonition according to Webster's, is the counsel of warning against fault. Let us hear now the timeless instruction of Jesus, verses 10 and 11. This is the grand finale. This is the reason why this account is worthy of our study. And straightening up, Jesus stands back up and now looks at the lady. Woman, where are they? Where did they go? Did no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way. And from now on, sin no more. Jesus' message to self-righteous, murderous, unbelieving, religious hypocrites is noted in verse 7. We, people quote, quote John 8, 7 all the time, take it out of context. It's not just a general statement to anyone. It's a specific statement to a specific people who are, they don't love the law of God. They're they're legalistic. They're self-righteous. They're hypocritical. They're murderous. They're unbelieving. It's to them that this word comes in verse 7, that he who is without sin among you, religious unbeliever, let him be the first to throw a stone at her, this immoral adulteress. In verse 10, for the first time, Jesus directly addresses the immoral adulteress. And I remind you, we see here again something that is spectacular about Jesus, something that is in some ways, in our sinfulness, frightening. That Jesus possesses divine omniscience. You can run, but you can't hide. You can hide, but what you try to hide, he can see. Jesus possesses spiritual x-ray vision. There's some things that some of you are involved in that you're happy that nobody knows about. You forgot about one person, the most important person, Jesus, who is the final judge. Jesus knows us from the inside out. He manifests this 
Throughout his ministry, John records some of those examples, such as in John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, when he performed miracles in Jerusalem during the beginning of his ministry. Some people were, were amazed by the show, and they say, I want to sign up for this. I want to follow this guy. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them because their faith was bogus. It wasn't genuine faith. John 2, 23 to 25. He shows his omniscience again in John chapter 4, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, John 4, 16 to 19. You've said it well, you don't have a husband. (laughs) And the man you're currently shacking up with isn't one of them. But here, Jesus' omniscience sees something that that I believe was wrought in her through through a mighty act of the Holy Spirit. Jesus addresses the lady. Let's look at this in verse 10. What does he ask? What does he say? He says, ma'am, where are they? We've seen images the past few weeks of the Taliban, uber-religious, murderous, hypocritical, self-righteous, blindly believing that they're doing the work of God. The mob coming around individuals ready to to beat or murder. Off they went. Jesus' question is, is he's saying, do you understand? Do you understand what just happened? To understand what just happened, you have to understand who Jesus is. It's awfully quiet here, don't you think? Her response translated three words. Three wonderful words. Three simple words. She said, John 8, 11, uh, John 8, verse 11, did no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. No one, is remarkable uh, because you would have assumed that many would have joined in and pouncing upon this this woman with their self-righteous zeal. But the key word is the word Lord. This response can be interpreted in one of two ways. What did she mean? Does she understand what just happened? In order to really understand, she has to understand who Jesus is. One possible interpretation is that she simply was saying here, no one, sir. That, that she's just being polite and, 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 and gracious uh, to this one that she understands to be a, some sort of religious leader. It's also possible that she meant, no one, Lord, It's possible that this lady's eyes may have been opened. Uh, She who did bad things in dark places may have been brought to the light to see Jesus and understand in light of who Jesus is, who she is. I believe in light of the forthcoming gospel admonition that the second answer is the correct interpretation. I believe what you have here is a totally unexpected conversion. And this shouldn't shock and astound us in view of what Jesus taught about the mysterious work of the the Holy Spirit and the great miracle that is the new birth, regeneration. Later, there's another account of a remarkable, unexpected conversion. Jesus is surrounded by two thieves, two criminals who deserved to die on the cross. And these guys were so bad and so, so hard-hearted that as they suffered for their sin and being paying the penalty on the cross justly, that they began to hurl abuse and to pile on while everyone else was around mocking Jesus, spitting on Jesus, scoffing at Jesus. But what happened? As, as Jesus responds to the worst of the, the world and the world's ways, as he speaks seven 
powerful words from the cross, unexpectedly, miraculously, one of the thieves on the cross, his eyes are open and he comes to understand who Jesus is. And Jesus affirms the salvation that had been wrought in his heart and the faith that had been granted to him and the eyes, that, the, the spiritual sight that was granted them when he says to them that remarkable word, truly this very day, you shall be with me in paradise. You say, well, this is a, a remarkable word from Jesus to an unclean, dirty lady. This is, if in fact she's saying, no one, Lord, then, then you know, does, does this sort of thing that happened back then, you know, does anything like this happen today? Do you ever hear about observe individuals who are, humanly speaking, unlikely converts? Did God not manifest this same remarkable, glorious, miraculous, unexpected work of grace in, in the lives of individuals who now are part of this congregation? Did we not just hear last Sunday night in the testimony of 14 individuals, some words from some individuals about I was blind and I was lost and I was involved in, in this, these sins? And what happened? God, by his grace, opened their eyes to understand who Jesus is that they might repent and entrust themselves to him and be gloriously delivered from their sins and rescued and saved by his grace. This it shouldn't shock any of us who've been a Christian for any period of time. This is exactly the kind of individual that God often chooses to glorify himself in by reaching out and pouring out his mercy on them. But before we, we get to that, let me just remind you of this. This lady deserves judgment. And she likely expects to hear a word of condemnation. Though the self-righteous, hypocritical, murderous, jealous, unbelieving religious Pharisees and scribes have been found to be hypocritical and, 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 and therefore they drop their stones and off they go. That's not true with Jesus. He who was without sin. He who is the Son of God. Jesus has every right to condemn this lady. Just as Jesus has every right to, to punish us for our sins. Jesus has every right to say to her what she would have expected to hear you depraved home wrecker. We talked last week about how serious God views the sin of adultery. You say, well, yeah, but the reason why Jesus says this is because of the context she found herself in. That's partially true. You say, well, Jesus doesn't rebuke her or condemn her here. He doesn't condemn her because he's just seeking not to really address her, but to address the Pharisees. That's not so. It's also not true that though her accusers are wolves in sheep's clothing, listen, friends, just because those individuals uh, were hypocritical and are wolves in sheep's clothing, that for a single moment doesn't excuse her sin. I see this all the time today, as do you. And sometimes we're guilty of this very thing. We try to excuse our own sin because of someone else's sin. So therefore, you know, my sin's not as bad or my sin doesn't really matter because I was sinned against. That's not the line that she, uh, the path that she takes. That's not the path of a repentant heart. Today we have people say, well, if, if, if I've been prejudiced against in some way, if, I've been, if, if, I've, if there's been the expression of racism and racial hatred against me, then that justifies me committing this sin, this sin, and this sin. That's not true. May I remind you, someone else's hypocrisy doesn't cancel out your immorality. Jesus does not sweep her sin under the rug. He does something far greater. He covers it 
He covers it with his blood. Some of you are saying, well, you know, I don't have a lot in common. I have a hard time relating to this passage. Jesus' word, remarkable for her, but not really for me. I've never, by the grace of God, committed adultery. And Christian, may I remind you, at one point, you were a hell-bound, hell-bent sinner. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul says to a, to, a, a, to a very pagan city with a collection of unlikely converts, and such were some of you. You say, well, I haven't committed any gross sexual sin. Yes, but you've committed a thousand other sins. Dear Christian, don't manifest the heart of a Pharisee. Many believers would be well served to spend more time rehearsing the sober message of Romans 3. The whole world is under the indictment of God. We're all, we all stand condemned according to God's righteousness and his holiness and his perfect justice. Romans 3, 10 through 31. Remind yourself of who you were and who you would be apart from the grace of God in Christ. Remind yourself that Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 is speaking about you, speaking about me. Romans 3, 10, oh, I've never committed adultery. Yeah, but don't forget this. There is none righteous, no, not one. You're part of the no, not one. There's none who seek God. Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each one of us then deserves to hear from the final judge what this lady would have expected to hear, guilty as charged. We have sinned against God time and time again. Dearly beloved, in view of this Story And in view of our own biography, may we stand amazed as we behold the amazing grace of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 11. Jesus does not say, you're condemned, you depraved, homewrecker. Instead, he provides the gospel admonition and he begins by saying this. Wonderful words. Powerful words, life-changing words. Jesus said to this adulteress, I do not condemn you either. Who is this Jesus? Why is this such a, 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 a marvelous and wonderful word worthy of our consideration, though this account happened 2,000 years ago? Because like the Holy Father, the Holy Son can forgive sin. Matthew chapter 9. That's essentially what the Savior is saying here. Neither do I condemn you. Your sins are forgiven. Beloved, John makes theological points and then he paints a a, a beautiful canvas taking actual events in the life of our Lord helping us to understand the truthfulness of statements that he makes about Jesus, such as John 3, 17 and 18. This is John 3, 17 and 18 in action. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in Jesus is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. God. Both deserve condemnation. It's the Pharisees who are under the judgment of God, for they will not receive Jesus because they are so self-righteous and proud. Jesus' gospel admonition is a game changer. This is amazing grace. This is the grace of God shining in the face of the Son of God, Jesus. This is the mercy of God at work. Neither do I 
condemn you. What do you hope to hear on that day when you stand before the judge? Neither do I condemn you. This is divine forgiveness, freely given. You say, well, she doesn't deserve it. Well, that's what grace is. But sometimes we forget if it's a free gift, salvation, if it's grace and mercy and love that is in the purpose plan of God to redeem sinners, to bring them back, to redeem them, to purchase them, to atone for their sins, to forgive them in Christ. We say, well, uh, you know, this is, this is glorious and, and, and wonderful, but this is what we would expect of, of God. And we only think that way when we have an inflated view of ourselves. Again, please be reminded that though divine forgiveness is freely given, it is not something we deserve and it is definitely not cheap. Jesus just can't say, you know, you're forgiven, let's move on now, you know, and, and, and walk obediently uh, and just act as if sin is no big deal, you know? Jesus will soon drink the full cup of God's holy wrath and justice. It is only because of the cross that Jesus can declare these words and that these words can be received and are, should be received as being gospel truth. This is why Paul says to the Romans, by extension, for those of you who are in Christ, that there is, here's the gospel word for you this morning, no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ. And that would include this lady. Neither do I condemn you because Jesus willingly bore our sins on Calvary's cross that God might be both just and the justifier of the one who believes in Jesus. Each one of us deserves to hear guilty as charged. Instead, to all of us who've been saved by God's Amazing grace, we, we welcome these glorious good news words. Neither do I condemn you. Dear Christian, how can we not sing at the top of our lungs? Songs like the one we sang before this sermon. What love could remember no wrongs we have done, omniscient, all-knowing, yet mercifully he counts not their sum, thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Mark it down. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. We cannot and should not be able to think about the amazing grace and magnanimous mercies of God in Christ without being moved to the heights of, of worship, stunned amazement. Turn with me to Psalm 32 for a moment. There's this wonderful song sung by a sinner who had been forgiven. And it, 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 it's a song that we can sing because it, it captures our Experience, believer. Let me, don't miss how miraculous and glorious and undeserved this mighty act of God in Christ and forgiving this undeserving, sinful, adulterous. David said, you know what, I, and this is David as a believer, he sinned and he didn't repent, and he didn't repent. And he says in verse 3 of Psalm 32, when I kept silent about my sin, I had physical consequences. My body wasted away. Some people have health problems because of unconfessed sin. And they have emotional problems. 
David said, when I kept silent about my sin, why keep silent about your sin? Jesus already knows it. And he is willing to forgive it according to God's great mercy. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. I'm not surprised that unbelievers have, they, they have the appearance of having everything, but they have nothing, and they turn to psychotherapists and drugs and alcohol. That's guilt and shame. That's a heavy burden. The way of the transgressor is hard. And that's actually a mercy of God that you might repent while there's still time to repent and experience the blessing and freedom of forgiveness. Verse 10, speaking of unbelievers, many are the sorrows of the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. And this all flows out of what is said in Psalm 32, verse 1. How can we not sing at the top of our lungs? How can we not willingly come to church, eager again to hear these great truths, to hear the gospel sung, prayed, and preached? Psalm 32, 1, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed we are. Neither do I condemn you. But some of you may say, won't radical grace lead to unbridled hedonism and licentious behavior? If if one can't out-sin the grace of God and they can't, won't that then lead to, you know, I'm just going to sin, God will be glorified in his demonstration of mercy and compassion? I mean, isn't this theology, this truth, this gospel wrought with, with potential for terrible things coming as a result of it? And Jesus' answer is essentially the same one the Spirit provides through Paul in Romans 6. May it never be. Again, we, 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 we mustn't miss the gospel admonition. It has two parts. There's a sense in which part one is for the legalist, and part two is for, for those who would be tempted to abuse the grace of God and turn it into a license for sin. We call that antinomianism or libertinism. He does say, neither do I condemn you, but that's not all he says. We mustn't ignore the latter part of the gospel admonition. Look at verse 11. Jesus says, <laughs> essentially, you're forgiven. Her eyes had been opened, Lord. But then what, what does he add? There's an admonition for her, for us who've been forgiven of this unpayable debt. Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. To put it in contemporary language, in view of God's grace in Christ, don't you dare go home the same way that some of you left the bar last night. God forbid that we turn divine mercy into a license for unbridled sin. When we act that way, we're actually living like false teachers, Jude 4 through 16. Jesus basically says to her, go and from now on, sleep around no more. Said differently, from now on, live to manifest the fruits of forgiveness. This is the 130th Psalm, verse 4. If you should hold our sins against us, O Lord, who could stand? Answer, no one. If God was holy, just, and righteous, and not gracious and merciful and loving, there would be no salvation. There would be no hope. We would all get what we deserve, which is judgment, death and judgment. But praise God, Psalm 134 says, but with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. In the words of another pastor, The proper response to mercy received on account of past sins is the pursuit of holiness in the future. Well, there's a a, a very practical component to this message and to the experience of salvation in Christ. The proper response to mercy received on account of past sins is the pursuit of holiness in the future. In other words, Jesus' gospel admonition is theologically rich and it is profoundly practical. We are saved 
not according to works, but by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sins. But don't miss this. God's justifying grace in Christ is the chief motivator and foundation of our progressive sanctification. We don't have to be guilt-tripped guilt into obedience. We have a higher motivation, grace. We are under grace, not law. We have a deeper love because we've been loved so supremely by the Lord when we were so unlovable. This is the foundation and the chief motivation to obedience as believers. In layman's terms, practically speaking, Jesus is saying this. Okay, here's the broader implication. Those of you, if you're a believer, this is you, who have been forgiven much, ought to love much. You've been forgiven much, you ought to forgive much. You've been forgiven much, you ought to serve much, hate sin much, tithe much, evangelize much. And I know you believe this because I hear how passionately you sing songs that affirm this. Grace, the foundation of our justification, the chief motivator of our sanctification. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. That's an interesting play on words, grace and, and debt. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let your goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. The gospel admonition, a word of forgiveness, and a gentle, friendly warning from the words of Christ, our great God and Savior who because of his perfect life, his substitutionary death, and his bodily resurrection can say to this lady and to any who would entrust themselves to him, neither do I condemn you. Now leave this place. Go and sin no more. Let us pray. Holy Father, your holy word and holy son have reminded us this morning that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, teaching us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to strive to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Holy Spirit, may Jesus' gospel admonition be the spiritual spark plug that ignites a grace-motivated pursuit of holiness. But Lord, <laughs> we know we've been here before celebrating your forgiveness, seeking to be motivated by grace and realizing that at some point this week, maybe by this afternoon, we will still sin Lord, when we do fall short in our pursuit of holiness, help us to remember neither do you condemn us. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our sins, they are many, but praise God, your mercy is more. We thank you for your gospel and for the Savior. We pray all these things in his blessed name. Amen.